Hey everyone, it's Rachel. This is a walkthrough of the first steps someone would take to use the Interactive Brokers API. Interactive Brokers provides a sample Java application that we're going to be looking at, which actually has a UI and makes exploration relatively simple. I'm going to demo using the API to get a one-off market data snapshot for a stock, to get ongoing live updates for a stock, and then to actually place an order. I had one person ask me to do this and frankly, that's enough for me, but also this is for everyone who thinks, yeah, I can program, but what's actually the first step in starting to write a trading bot that can talk to an exchange? So let's start in the docs. This is the Interactive Brokers API documentation. I'll link it in the description. Um, but basically, yeah, you can see all the functionality you get, like how to get bar data historically. That's pretty important. But if you're not as big a fan of docs and you'd rather just jump into the API itself, then let's do that. So we can go into installing the API source, open that up and thoroughly agree to the terms and conditions, of course. And I'm going to download the stable API because I'm a stable kind of person. So once we've done that, I'm going to open up IntelliJ. You can use whatever you want. And I'm going to create a new project from existing sources. Then we can go into the IBJTs folder, whatever that is. And then we can see samples and source. So source is the actual API code that we're going to use eventually, not yet. Um, but sample is where they show the sample code um, that Interactive Brokers actually provides to get started with. So I'm going to open that, import via Eclipse, and we can see on the left here, there's a bunch of sample code you can go digging into if you want. But I'm going to start with the test Java client, uh, more specifically in the main file, which is how you run it. So if we run that, we're going to get a bunch of build errors because I haven't set up the libraries properly. So I'm going to set up the libraries properly. So I'm going to set up the project structure, libraries, add a new Java library, and I'm going to use the source folder that I was mentioning before that actually contains the API. And we click apply, and now that should be good to build and just run. So what happens when that runs is it actually opens up a Swing UI. Now, I didn't think I'd have to touch Swing after uni, but I guess it came in handy. So we can see it's broken up into two major sections. On the left, we've got three sections where we receive output, where we show output. So the first one is where we see market and historical data, which we'll get to later. Um, the second one is TWS server responses. So that's Trader Workstation, which is the program that we use to run our broker platform. Um, then we've got errors and messages, which is just a bunch of the log messages that the sample code outputs. On the right, we've got a whole bunch of buttons and each button represents a piece of the Interactive Brokers API functionality that we can mess with. But in order to use this, we actually have to open Trader Workstation on our computer. So we can open up the Interactive Brokers login screen and basically that gives you two options, either of live trading or paper trading. So paper trading or simulated trading is really cool because it's a fake account. It has real market data, but it doesn't have any consequences if you screw up. So that's always a really, really good option to start with. And that's what I started with, but I'm going to go into live trading today. So then we can go back to the UI and hit connect, and that'll give us a whole bunch of defaults that we don't have to touch apart from port. So port will either be 7496 or 7497, depending on if we want to use live trading or paper trading, but otherwise we can just hit okay. And then we can see the output that, yep, we're all connected. The market data is good and everything's set up nice. So I'm just going to clear that there's a clear button down the bottom that clears all the panels so we can start from scratch and, you know, see the output more clearly for everything we do subsequently. So I'm looking at QQQ here, which is the NASDAQ 100, and we can see in our broker platform generic high level information like the bid and the ask. Um, but I want to get that information via the API. So we can go to request market data, press that button. It brings up a new window and basically we can leave all the defaults as the same, but change the stock to QQQ. That's the one I want. And we want to select a snapshot of market data so we can select that and then press OK. And then we can see the API comes back with a whole bunch of information. We can see the bid price and the ask price, and they seem to match up with what's shown in the brokerage platform. So that seems to be working. But if we want to actually see what API is calling, then we can jump into the code and just search for the button name. So request market data, let's search the code for that. We can find where the button's set up in the code and we can see the action listener listening to that button. So we can just jump through the code. It's pretty simple. And we can see which fields it's taking information from. Um, so that we know what is actually going through in this request. And we can more importantly see which part of the interactive brokers API is it actually calling if we want to replicate this. And one thing that's really helpful is it has a bunch of failure cases coded in that it's checking for. And the docs aren't really that explicit about what failure cases to look for. So this is actually quite helpful looking through the sample code instead of looking through the docs.
So now let's move on to historical data. I'm going to clear the logs so we can start afresh and then click on the historical data button. So basically I want to keep the same symbol QQQ and I want to go into the historical data query options. So basically we can tweak this to say what kind of bar size we want if we're getting bars and how, how far into history do we want to go? So I'm going to leave it as the default that it's set to now, which is one month worth of data for one day candles. So if we run this query, we should be able to see some good results from the last month. So yep, we can see that we've got the data now for every day over the past month. We have the high, low, close, open, the volume weighted average price and the count. I will be honest, I have no idea what the count is, but <laughs> um, you know, maybe it's useful. Okay, so now let's look at tick by tick data. So a tick is basically a transaction on an exchange to simplify it down a bit. So if you look at the QQQ chart on the left in the actual brokerage platform, we are gonna be able to see how this maps up to the tick by tick data re we request from the API. So we can see it's pretty slow moving right now because we are currently in out of hours trading, which is pretty slow. But you can see whenever the price updates on the left, you should see it update in the logs here on the right. And so that tick by tick data is just going to come through indefinitely until you cancel the request. So you can see uh, on the right column of buttons, there's a whole bunch of cancel requests for certain requests that come through indefinitely until you cancel them. And now I'll just jump through placing an order. So we hit the place order button and we can keep a lot of the defaults as they are. Basically it defaults to a limit order. Um, it has some default size things. Basically I'm just going to try by one QQQ stock for $100. Now QQQ is way higher than that. So this isn't actually going to execute, but it should put the order into the brokerage platform. So let's try that out. And okay, so it's half worked. So basically it's giving me an error saying that, hey, you can't place an order out of hours. This order is going to be placed tomorrow automatically for you. So I haven't allowed my bot to place orders outside of hours. I'm pretty sure you can configure it to do so. That's just not something I want my bot doing. So I try and take care of those ones myself. Um, but in this UI, I can come through and hit cancel. And even though I placed the order with the API, I can still cancel it via the UI manually myself. And if we go back to the swing UI, we can see that in the, in the various logs it's given, it knows that I've canceled that order. So if the API places the order, then the API can get updates about everything that happens to that order, even if you did it manually. So obviously I just scratched the surface here and there's a lot more to explore in terms of functionality and depth, but that was the foundation for the start of exploration. If you'd like to hear a high level of my approach to a trading bot or hear about all the trading bot mistakes I made, you can click any of these links. Otherwise, I hope this was helpful. Like and subscribe if you're into trading content and I'll see you in the next video.